Hello, my name is Al Guyant. I'm a resident of Sun Prairie, and I'm here today with State Representative Gary Hebel, and we're going to be talking about major issues that are at stake in Sun Prairie and Wisconsin, and we're going to ask uh, State Representative Gary Hebel for information and what we can really do about some of these issues. We're going to be talking about jobs, the economy, education, health care, and the environment. And so let's start with jobs and economy. It's sort of like the weather. Everyone talks about it. People complain about it. Well, what can we really do? So, Gary, um, what's going on in jobs and economy, and what can we really do about it? What can you do as a legislator? What can the citizens do as participants in our democracy? Thank you, Al. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these issues with you. Obviously, jobs and the economy are currently the most important issue that we have in this state. Unfortunately, during the last two years, Wisconsin has seen the greatest loss of jobs uh, than any other state in the country. And we've made significant uh, uh, efforts to try to uh, improve the situation, but unfortunately, uh, we have not done a very good job in this state. And uh, I have to blame that on the, on the majority party that uh, currently is in existence at the state capitol. Uh, we have really done a, a poor job of passing legislation to encourage job creation. There are a lot of ways that we can create jobs in this state. And to give you a few ideas of where we really fell by the wayside, uh, they jump out me quite uh, brightly. When you look at uh, things like, we had a, uh, the ability for wind siting, which is a, a jobs creation bill where the, the state and the, uh, the uh, commissions had determined a process in which wind siting for these uh, wind uh, uh, turbines, if you will, mm -hmm. could be set up in the state. We had the ability to create um, a thousand jobs practically immediately once we had these uh, siting requirements in place. It had taken a two-year process, a bipartisan effort to set up the wind siting uh, process, and the, the majority of the party just blew that away, said we're not going to do that. Thousand jobs, $1.2 billion dollars in investments would have come to this state in creating the, uh, the wind siding, the, the wind turbines, and other envi environmental uh, energy processes that are created by that. That's one option we had. Another option we had, high-speed rail. Now, that's mm -hmm. a very hot topic, mm -hmm. and it was a very heated discussion. But we had $800 million from federal government to come to our, our state uh, to provide for a high-speed rail set up between Milwaukee and Madison, which ultimately would carry that through to Minneapolis. Now, the, the criticism there was that uh, it would, we would have to pay for the cost of maintaining it once it's in place, but there was federal funding available also to pay for the cost of that. In addition to not only having high-speed rail, it would have created the foundation, the infrastructure, if you will, for not only high-speed rail for passengers, but also greatly improved the infrastructure for freight uh, uh, traffic between uh, Madison and Milwaukee and ultimately uh, on to Minneapolis. So the infrastructure that we talk about is a, is a great job creator and we lost that opportunity as well. Let me follow up on the high-speed rail question. Uh, many jobs uh, would have been created to build the system as you explained. Right. Um, what about the long-term implications of high-speed rail um, for the economic corridor from Chicago, Madison to Minneapolis? Um, how would that high-speed rail have uh, affected or contributed to job creation, economic development, and years and decades down the road? Well, anyone you talk to that's in the business of creating jobs, even WMC, We'll talk about their number one concern is to make sure That's that Wisconsin we have, Manufacturers and Commerce. Right, and they're generally a left, a right-leaning group, but they'll tell you that the most important thing for job creations is to have an educated workforce, mm -hmm. and then second to that, they, the tax rate's important, and also transportation. So transportation is an extremely important element for job creations, for businesses, uh, corporations to set up here in Wisconsin. So long term, that setup of the high-speed rail and the improvement of the infrastructure would have been enormously effective in terms of improving the job market in this state. You know, we go back to, if you remember, you don't remember, but your, your uh, grandparents remember when the interstate system was mm -hmm. set up in the United States. And there was a lot of criticism, a lot of, a lot of thoughts saying, you're wasting your money. And can you imagine our country without an interstate system? 
You know, you, as, a, as a legislator, you need to be a visionary to a certain degree. Now, I'm elected every two years, mm -hmm. so it's hard to be a visionary for two years, but you really have to look at the long range of what's going to happen to our state and our country. I actually do remember that system. I'm older than you think, and oh. it was called the National Defense Highway System yes. created by Eisenhower because of his experiences that he had when he saw our highways before that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you had uh, talked about long-term job creation and the education um, component of that. Why don't we uh, pick up on um, education, uh, what's going now, what's going on now, what can you see being done in the next uh, legislative session and perhaps beyond that um, where our education system um, helps create those job possibilities down the road? As I said, WMC, Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, say that jobs are the number one uh, factor that they look at is quality education. Here in Sun Prairie and in the entire 46th mm -hmm. Assembly District, education is the number one priority of my constituents. We yeah. passed the largest mm -hmm. referendum for financing a school in the state of Wisconsin when we built our high school, $95 million. That's the most, uh, a referendum, the most amount of a referendum has ever passed since then or uh, subsequent to that time. So here in Sun Prairie, our folks really believe that education is a priority. I come from a family of 17 children. <laughs> and my, my folks ingrained in us a couple of things. Mm -hmm. One is that education is your key to the future. Mm -hmm. And in order for you to get ahead in life, it, the education is a great equalizer. You can have wealthy kids all around you. You, you. you may not have much money, but if you have a quality education, no door is closed to you. Mm -hmm. So we were impressed with that. And all of my siblings um, have gone to college. Most of them graduated. Most of them have advanced degrees. So it's important for us that education is maintained. Now, unfortunately, the last two years, we had a, a horrible cut to our K through 12, $1.6 billion cut, the most of any state in the nation in terms of cuts mm -hmm. to K through 12. And uh, that's gotta have a devastating effect. Now it won't be immediate, but it's like anything, it takes time. Education isn't a day by day process that you see the results immediately. It's over time. And when you make those kind of cuts to education, it's going to have a devastating effect to our educational process. Let me ask you, uh, on the education and the how it affects uh, jobs creation, Madison is becoming known more and more uh, for developing high-tech uh, industries. Several were mentioned in today's newspaper, two, three employees, uh, maybe having 10, 20 high-tech employees down the road. Um, comment, if you will, on the uh, cuts in education statewide, um, how that affects uh, some prairie and the state in the competition uh, throughout not only the United States, but the developed world for these jobs. Well, we're competing on a national, international market with other, other countries to, to get these jobs. So the educated workforce is extremely important. Our technical colleges were cut significantly and our university system had one of the greatest cuts of any university system in the country. And so when you cut education, it's got to have an effect on that. And so what we need to do is get back to the idea that our number one priority is to make sure that we provide a quality education for all of our kids, K through 12, technical schools, and the university system. The University of Wisconsin is an economic engine that has the ability to create thousands of jobs. And we developed, not I, but our state developed the Wisconsin idea, which said that the university knowledge, what they uncover, what they, the research and development comes up with, is to extend not just to the boundaries of the university, but the entire state. And so the Wisconsin idea is something that we embrace, and we can, can gain a ton of jobs through the economic engine that the University of Wisconsin provides. We need to really enhance the ability to gain jobs from that source. So in the next few years, we'll have another legislative session. Let me ask you a three-part question. Um, 
What should the legislature do in the next few years on the education, strengthening uh, the education system? Uh, what uh, would you do as a legislator in, in that process? And what can the viewers, the citizens do? Uh, this isn't something done just by 133 legislators. Um, what can the citizens do that are viewing this program um, to help bring about what you think needs to be done? Well, I think we have to elect uh, legislators that are willing to have the vision to realize that education is our future. So we get those legislators in place. And then we look at a legislative body that is bipartisan, that works together. Because one party does not have all the answers. And frankly, the minority party was shut out these last two years, and then we had a lot of great ideas that fell by the wayside. We had 45 jobs bills that never that died on the floor that would have the ability to create a ton of jobs. So we have to elect a legislature that values education as a top priority. And then, as a legislative body, we need to work to make sure that we get the best bang for the buck. And MATC, technical colleges, frankly, is one of the best bangs for the buck that we have. And so there were cuts to, to uh, technical colleges that made no sense at all. One of the things we needed was training in the education for people to be job ready mm -hmm. after two years of, of training. Well, there were cuts that we worked very hard to try to uh, replace because those educational cuts resulted in waiting lists at technical colleges that resulted in the people who wanted a job had the desire to get that education in a one or two year program were shut because there was no uh, no teachers, no no staff, no no rooms available for them. All right, so it's kind of clear what you want to do as a uh, future legislator, uh, what you want the legislature and the governor to do. Um, what about the citizens? Um, besides voting, um, what else um, do they need to do? It's uh, it's their democracy, their education system. Uh, what do you want them to do? When we passed Act 10, which, which took away collective bargaining, the uh, legislative body that was hearing the public hearings on it listened for a short time. We, as a minority party, said that, though this is wrong, you don't make a decision that affects collective bargaining for a, a lot of workers in the state mm -hmm. and try to pass it in the dark of night or don't give the public the ability to testify on it, that's wrong. So we, as a minority party, held public hearings. After the, uh, the uh, committee closed their hearings, they said, we've heard enough. Even though there was a, a huge room of people wanting to testify, they said, no, we don't want to listen anymore. As a legislator, your obligation is to listen. You need to listen to all your constituents, not just those that support you. And I feel that's extremely important for me. We spent 140 hours straight. 18,000 people testified in that committee, informal committee because it wasn't uh, part of the majority party, but we listened to how Act 10 would affect them. And it's amazing what you find out. It's, it's devastating what Act 10, how that affected so many people in this state. Wisconsin has always had a very clean, transparent, open government. This last two years, we did not have that. Well, that uh, can bring us up to another extremely important issue that was covered in the media extensively and is going to be coming back, um, and specifically um, the environment. Um, it's a big word, uh, sort of like jobs in the economy, but when it gets down to specifics, it makes a difference on what we eat, drink, or breathe. Um, and how it affects our children uh, and developing children. Um, what do you see is at stake uh, for our environment in Sun Prairie area and Wisconsin? Uh, what would you propose that should happen? You know, I've been fortunate to travel a lot around the country. And whenever I come back to Wisconsin, it's almost like you get to the border and you enter one of the, it's, it's like entering Eden or paradise. It, it's such a beautiful state. And it's not something that just happened. Our forefathers in this state had the insight to protect our environment. We've had great, great people, Gaylord Nelson, who established Earth Day, and so many other environmentalists or cons conservationists, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. who really valued the quality of our environment. We have that legacy, that heritage that we must retain. And frankly, we have some short-sighted uh, members of our legislature that feel that jobs at any cost, regardless of the environment, is the way to go. 
I will never cater to that position. We have this mining bill that we want to pass up in northern Wisconsin that, frankly, I want the jobs as much as anybody. But I also want to make sure that we protect our pristine environment with the water and the air and the ground so we do not contaminate that for our future generations. This is something we're blessed with and we want to maintain the quality of our environment. Well, maybe we could ask, just as an example, to explore something specific about environment. The, um, the mining bill uh, or bills that might be drafted about the iron mine that uh, would be above the watershed, uh, the big rice beds in northern Wisconsin that very close to Lake Superior, uh, the sulfides that might flow from all of that, millions of tons. Um, do you have any uh, uh, feeling that uh, now as to whether or not um, there could be a way to develop the um, uh, mine and, and still be environmentally uh, safe? Absolutely. I believe there's a way that it can be done appropriately to protect our environment. But do you understand that the bill that was proposed by the majority party gave the ability to the mining company, they basically wrote the environmental bill. They said what they wanted, and, and the leaders of the majority party said, okay, without any consideration of public input of the experts in the environmental field to weigh in on what the important elements were to that policy. What that does is that gives the ability to create jobs to a private sector. Understand that a corporation's sole objective is to be profitable. They don't have a conscience. They don't have a, a social requirement to protect the environment. That's why we have laws and regulations so that those corporations, those mining companies, abide by the terms that we set for them to make sure that our environment is not contaminated. They're not going to do it on their own. And you think deregulation is, is uh, the possible way to solve that and uh, competition, the best will rise to the top. That's been proven time and time again, that there's certain areas where government regulation is absolutely crucial to protect environment. Speaking of regulation, um, probably most people viewing this program and, and the general public uh, don't understand the significance of administrative rules and regulation. Um, but uh, as I understand it, in the last legislature, um, independent, uh, semi-independent agencies like the Department of Natural Resources with its oversight board, uh, all of their rules now uh, can be stopped uh, by one person, the governor, which is essentially uh, taking away the commission independence. Um, what are your thoughts about um, that authority for one person to take away all the rule independence of our independent uh, agencies like Department of Natural Resources, regulation, uh, licensing agencies? This is a question that's very dear to my heart. I serve as a ranking member on JCRAR with the Rulemaking rule Committee, and I've seen changes in the rules in that committee that would, would just blow your mind because frankly what it does, it sets up the governor as the final arbiter, the dictator, if you will, to determine whether, even though the legislature passes a law, the Rules Committee has to determine the enforcement of that law and the governor can literally stop any law that's been passed by just not taking any action. And I fought tooth and nail to at least put a limit on the time that the governor had in which to act on a rule. Take 30 days, take 90 days, and the Republicans would not allow any time limit. Now that's, that's great right now for them and their governor, but down the road, no governor is going to give up that power unilaterally. So it's gonna take a legislature to overcome that power. Right now, we, in Wisconsin, we have the governor's ability and a budget to line item veto any area that he doesn't like, a sentence, a word, a number, he can cut that out. By line, we, our governor has the most power of any governor in, in the United States in terms of the line item veto on a budgetary bill. Now he has that power, or she, if we have a female governor, has the power to stop laws from going into effect with uh, not acting on the Rules Committee suggestions. Okay. Let, let's, uh, with our time remaining, we've got a few, um, uh, at least one more, uh, two more issues to deal with, uh, health care and ethics, particularly regarding the judiciary. Let me ask about health care. Uh, I read a startling statistic recently that 37% of Medicaid dollars uh, are spent 
on uh, nationally anyway, caring for uh, seniors in nursing homes or something like that. Uh, what do you see are the consequences of the health care actions in Wisconsin or inaction? Um, and what do you think needs to be done uh, so we uh, continue to have um, good health care for those who have it and some health care for those who have none? Currently, we have uh, many people that are not insured. Prior to this administration, we had 97% of all citizens in Wisconsin covered by insurance, including all children. That's no longer true as a result of the current administration and the actions they have taken. Now, uh, there's this Obamacare, we talk about uh, uh, Affordable Care for Affordable Care Act, and frankly, that is what we need to make sure everyone in our state is covered by health insurance. Now, we pay 18%, our, our, our national, the amount of uh, percentage of our uh, assets, 18% of them go to health care, much higher than any other country in the world. Yet our, our uh, medical uh, care is not as good as many of those countries. So that tells you there's some profit taking, a significant amount of profit taking. As a result of that, many people are left uninsured. Now, in Wisconsin, our governor has decided not to uh, do the, set up the exchanges to provide for health care for all citizens in the state. He's waiting for the election to occur. As a result of that, many people in the state are not able to get the health care that they need and they deserve. Now, there's a, a real basic argument of whether you believe health care is a privilege or a right. And I would argue that everyone in this state is entitled to basic health care. And right now, many of those people, the health care they get, there's no preventative health care. When they get sick enough, they go to the emergency room. The absolute most expensive cost for health care is at the emergency room. They've got to be treated by those uh, uh, emergency rooms. What does that result in? Tremendous cost, tremendous waste of our medical dollars. Uh, and we need to become much more efficient with the medical dollars that we have. And frankly, I think the program that the, the, the president has set up is one that I think is, okay. is, is the best. We have about uh, two, three minutes left. Um, and uh, so let me ask you about um, uh, everybody knows the state Supreme Court in Wisconsin is a mess. Um, and uh, we have ethics charges, one judge grabbing another judge by the neck. Um, what do you see in the future? What do you propose the legislature um, produces to uh, restore Wisconsin to the historically uh, viewed uh, clean, open government compared to what we see going on in our Supreme Court now? In two minutes. In two minutes. <laughs> Fix the problem in two minutes. In two minutes. Well, let's give yeah. that a shot. I've served on the Judiciary Committee as a ranking member, and it's very, these issues are dear to my heart as well. And what I'll tell you is that the main problem right now is I love elections. There's been talk about appointing Supreme Court justices rather than electing them. And under the current situation, either one would be, would be fine because of the Citizens United case, which resulted in tons of money being poured into this state and other states by special interests without any identity as to who they are or what the sources of funds are. So we are having elections purchased. And we're seeing that right now with the presidential race. It's just there's so much money coming in and there's so many ads being bought. Our electorate is becoming much more educated. Here in Wisconsin, I'm very impressed with people not buying in to the, to the uh, bombardment of ads, which is great because the polls are showing that the, the real issues are, are coming to the fore and not the political buyout. So with regards to the Supreme Court, if we can get away, and frankly, we did have public financing of, of the Supreme Court races in the, this current legislative session. We eliminated that. But the previous election actually was one of the, one of the uh, uh, best ones in terms of, of funding, but then Citizens United came in towards the end of that and it just blew the whole thing wide open. But there were limits on the amount of money that could be spent. Frankly, I think in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, uh, elections, we need to have a limit on expenditures in order to make the, the issues come to the fore and not the one with the most money or, or the most special interest as getting elected. Thanks. Um, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Representative Gary Hebel, for spending a half hour with us. We have about one minute left. Um, would you give us a, a summary as to what you see um, uh, needs to be done and how you're going to work towards that? 
Absolutely. You know, uh, again, uh, coming from a large family, education is absolutely crucial. We need to make sure as a legislature, as a legislative body, that we protect the integrity of our educational system here in the state from K uh, through 12 all the way on to uh, postgraduate work. That is absolutely our future, so we need to protect that. And our environment is extremely important. We need to maintain the quality of that environment because tourism is the second biggest industry in our state, agriculture being number one. Those are very, the environment is very important to those two areas. Healthcare is a priority. We need to make sure that all of our citizens, no matter what the status in life is, they all have the ability to get quality health care. And we also have to create the jobs so that we don't have such a tax burden on the middle class. So our, our efforts must focus in on getting in as many jobs created as possible. And I'm talking about jobs that uh, support a family, not the uh, uh, 5 or $8 an hour jobs. And uh, we're seeing, actually in San Francisco, we've had some great, we got Woodman's come in and they pay 12 bucks an hour. We got the... Uh, the uh, uh, other place, um, Costco. Costco is coming in. Same thing. They're paying a, a reasonable wage for these young kids that now they're able to, to generate some income, make some savings, and go to school. I mean, those are the kind of jobs that we need, and so that's what we need to work at. And it's extremely important that we do that. Thank you, and citizens, um, it's your job to learn more and vote and express your views to your legislator, your governor and be part of this democracy. It's not a spectator sport. We all work together. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Just in, in, in closing, I want everyone to know that the election is coming up November 6th. It's an extremely important election. It's uh, not only the local races, but nationally. Uh, these races are very important to every one of yours future. So make sure that you vote. And also be aware that on October 22nd, that's the first day of absentee ballots. They're available that day. And if it's inconvenient for you to vote on November 6th, you don't need any reason to uh, absentee vote early. So you don't have to be sick or, or out of the state. You can absentee vote anytime starting October 22nd. And remember that the voter ID law that frankly was a, uh, uh, an oppressive uh, act to try to prevent people from voting is not in effect. So there are certain requirements that you, you need to meet, but frankly, you, we still have same day registration with voting and uh, it's, it's easy to vote, please exercise your civic duty and get out and vote. Thank you very much.